Yesterday I had the opportunity to go to an old demo sale where they were just clearing out a house where the fellow passed away and they're going to tear the house down. They said, anything you want in the basement, you can have. So let's check out what I was able to save. Hey guys, I'm standing out in the workshop now and I just got a haul of a bunch of stuff from an estate. An uh, old friend of mine, uh, one of his uh, family friends, passed away and left a bunch of junk in his basement that was all going to go to the dump. So he said, come on over and grab what you want. So this is some of the stuff that I got. Uh, a Betamax, Super Beta Hi-Fi. This is a Toshiba. Uh, this is a DVD VHS and DVD recorder that will work with DVD RAM, DVD dash R, and DVD dash RW. Also got this nice old Akai amplifier. AM2450. Some of the knobs are missing unfortunately. But that's the way it arrived. Some of the other stuff that I got, well you already saw the other Betamax, the SL2500. I also got this Pioneer single disc CD player and a Panasonic VHS Hi-Fi. A couple more VCRs. This one's a, what is this one? It's an Emerson and a ProScan VCR and another Akai amplifier. Again, I don't know what shape any of these are in, but we'll look at them all. In that box it says VMT285. I don't think it is. It's a top loader VCR. I haven't even looked at the model yet, but there's a top loader VCR in there. There's another Panasonic VCR and a Sony VHS Hi-Fi. A little Citizen bookshelf. This is probably just going to go for parts. You know, I keep the motors out of stuff like this, but we'll look and see. We'll try it out. I'll take it apart for sure and uh, see if it will work. And if not, if the motor's any good, I'll keep the motor for a spare because uh, we, it's always good to have uh, motors for cassette decks and belts and stuff if they're any good. But this one will certainly get looked at. Also got a Sony, I guess this is a TCE500A stereo tape recorder. I believe this might be a vacuum tube one. I might be wrong, but uh, it doesn't say solid state on it. And it weighs a ton, so I have a sneaking suspicion that this one's a vacuum tube, complete with the two speakers that fold over the top cover. But wait, there's more. Uh, Technics SLPD887 5 disc CD changer whatever the hell this thing is, it's some type of computer peripheral maybe it is a computer it could very well be a computer of some type or something specialized I'll have to take it apart and see it is a computer has a little hard drive in here what size of drive is that? does it say? 20 gigabytes so Toshiba 20 gigabyte drive IDE type but this is a definitely a computer and it was probably part of a point of sale I'm thinking it's probably a point of sale uh, um, like a cash register point of sale unit the guy did own a bar that tip passed away so this may have been from this may have been his point of sale this might have all its customer records on it but we'll, 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 we'll turn this thing on and plug it into a monitor and see what it does be interesting to see whether it's usable for anything or whether it's just a, a dedicated uh, point of sale machine. It's possible that this might be able to be turned into like a, a media station, a media player, because it does have LAN inputs on it and it has VGA output and uh, doesn't have HDMI, I don't think, but uh, but it'll certainly play into a into a, a VGA type monitor. Doesn't have much in the way of memory, but looks like it could be expanded. Maybe not. That's a card. That's a peripheral slot for something else. Anyway, eh, we'll take a look at this thing at some point. Power supply over here. Little Iowa or AWA CS230. Little portable cassette radio. Yeah, I know it's not worth anything, but it may have a motor that's usable. And uh, it'd be interesting to see what's inside this thing before it gets thrown away or parts salvaged from it. Maybe it even still works. Another Akai piece, this one's a cassette deck, a Dolby cassette deck, and this one's an HXA1 cassette deck, and a receiver, or is this a tuner? This is a receiver. And this one's an ATK110, 
Oh, it's just a tuner. AM FM stereo tuner. So no, that would probably be what went with the uh, the other amplifier, I'm thinking, but that's just a straight tuner. AC, ATK 110. I have an ATK 02. A Dimplex portable construction heater, brand new in the box, with the price tag still on it. This thing's sealed. It's never been opened. And uh, runs on 240 volts. I'm very familiar with this particular piece because uh, that's what I use to, to actually heat my shop with. There's mine just mounted up to the railing for the, the garage door. That's what you hear making all the racket in the background when I got the heat on. And that thing is, uh, say, 4,800 watts. That thing brings this thing, the, this shop, from freezing up to toasty warm in about uh, 45 minutes. I fire that thing up and I turn on the ceiling fan over here and uh, that really uh, circulates the warm air fairly quickly and uh, makes this place workable even when it's uh, sub-zero outside. He also had a, a B&K model 1246 digital uh, color generator. This is for generating like test patterns like crosshatch and dots and purity test for setting up the old uh, CRT sets. I remember we had one of these at the the, well, the first shop that I worked at. We had one of these ones. I had a Sencor at the second uh, the shop I was at for 20 years. We had a Sencor. But the first shop I was at, we had one of these. I also got this LG DVD RW plus RW plus R and DVD dash R recorder. This one's got a hard drive built in. I already have one, but the one I've got uh, doesn't have a hard drive. So this is a DVR type. Again, no remote control for it, so it's kind of... I can use my universal remote for it, my uh, Harmony, but without the remote control, these are quite useless. But we'll check it out and see whether it uh, does anything. This is a B&K Television Analyst Model 12, uh, 1075. This is a flying spot test pattern generator. Generates good old uh, resolution chart, kind of like the monoscope camera that was used in TV stations. And this basically turns this into a monoscope. Uh, the way a monoscope operated was a little bit different than this. So this one uses a slide with the test pattern on it. As you can see, if I hold this up with the camera focus on it, find something white behind me so that the camera will focus. But this generates a test pattern. And that's the test pattern that comes with, gives you the, your bandwidth up to 4 megahertz. Right there, that's 325 lines. And that's about all the consumer versions would do. Now the difference between this and a real monoscope is a real monoscope camera had this etched into a metal target that was inside the tube. So the only thing a monoscope camera produced was an image. It was a, a metal mask in the surface of the tube that was etched with the good old Indian head. Namely, that one. That was what a real monoscope tube looked like. It had that image on it. The television analyst is a flying spot. Inside the unit, there's a CRT that just displays, I think it's kind of like a, almost a, a violet raster that uh, this displays. It just displays a square raster. That slide sits in front of it. And as the as the spot moves across the screen, of course, it's, it's either allowing light through the transparent portions or the, the black for, uh, portions are blocking the signal. And if there was any grayscale, it would also show the the grayscale this is in a light proof section of it it's all dark here and it, it the image from the flying spot is picked up by the photomultiplier tube here it's a photomultiplier tube when light hits it it conducts so this is like the this is like the pickup tube in a camera but for a still image or a slide so this is the the video head end for this unit I haven't plugged this unit in. It needs a total recap and rework before I even turn it on. The slide just goes down in the front like that. It's held up against the CRT. Interesting thing with this these units. First shop I worked at, we had one. It was used. It was used in the back when we were repairing stuff. I only got to use it once. Uh, the beauty of this thing is you could generate the horizontal grid and the vertical grid drive for old vacuum tube TVs. It would also generate the 4.5 megahertz sound and the 3.58 megahertz uh, color subcarrier. And you could have the audio, either a modulated audio, like an audio input, 
or tone and you can set your horizontal drive and your RF attenuator to, to, for testing tuner sensitivity. You can get video out right there from the video out plug on the front. No phono plugs or anything, just an output in the ground terminal and turn the color burst on or off. And you can change your video polarity for positive or negative. Over here, off, standby, and on. And you could tune the output to any channel between 2 and 13. And you could also output an IF strip anywhere from 25 to 45 megahertz. And you could select RF or IF or video out. Video level control, your audio input went in there. Your RF and IF output came out there. And baseband video came out there. Um, what we did with this thing when we had it at the shop that I worked at when I was like, I don't know, 15 or 16. Most of the stuff, though, by that time was all color TVs. And what the uh, owner of the shop would do with this thing, besides ready to throw the thing out. I always wanted it, but he never gave it to me. Uh, the one he had was a little bit different. It was a little bit older. It didn't have the slide that went in the top. It did, but it had the top that actually lifted up. You had like a door on the top. You could flip it open and see everything inside it. This one here, you have to pull the chassis out. Um, it was a gray one too, a lot older, I think, than this one. But what he used to do back in the day was he would uh, have one of his uh, newspaper ads that would run in the newspaper, and he would take it to the uh, take it over to the stationery store, and he'd have the ad photocopied onto a transparency and he'd put the transparency in front of the tube and have it showing on the TVs in his store. He'd have the newspaper ad, you know, in black and white, obviously, but uh, he would have his newspaper ad displayed on the TVs. He turned the uh, channel knob to a channel that wasn't in use. And at the time on our, our cable system, there were dead channels. At the, back in this day this is before we had all these all the fancy cable channels but wherever there was a local station broadcasting in this case uh, channel 2 was local channel 8 was local and uh, those channels were what they call secondary impaired channels on the cable system and the cable companies typically didn't use them because depending on where you were you'd get uh, uh, ingress from the broadcast transmitter so they were channels that weren't being used so he would set this down to like channel two and inject it into his cable and all the TVs in the shop, he could just tune them to channel two and it would display his television or his, uh, his ad from the newspaper. This was actually done by the, the previous owner of the shop before I worked there. I used to hang out there and go in there when I was a kid and I'd see their ads on the, the TV and I'd ask, oh, how did you get the, how would you get the picture on there? And I remember him taking me in the back and showing me this thing and I thought it was the most cool device I ever saw a flying spot it was uh and they say when I worked there when I was a little bit older when I worked there I only used it once for uh, testing a TV I was working on a tube TV and I actually used it to generate a horizontal drive horizontal grid to drive a uh, TV that was that had no horizontal and we were trying to verify whether it was a problem in the oscillator or a problem in the output so when I was in training, I learned how to use this thing briefly once and never used it again. There's a look at it from the back. So it's got the horizontal uh, output tube here. There's a flyback in here. Here's the picture tube that just displays a white image. Yeah, I guess you could probably feed that thing video and get a video image on it too, but that's not the point. It's just designed to display, display a white image for that uh, flying spot uh, scanner. But it's got basically everything that a black and white TV would have had in it at the time. No tuner, but it still had all the oscillators and everything so that it could generate RF for outputting a signal. And I also got this old Edison phonograph. There's the speaker. The volume is actually controlled by that damper, which is connected to this, like a bicycle cord. When you pull on the, uh, or push on the, the uh, cable, it'll actually push that damper into the horn to make it quieter because there was no other way to adjust the volume. These things played at one volume loud. This is the control and you just moved it like that and what that did is that pushed that plug
plug into the damper or into the horn. And to make it loud, you removed it. That's how you adjusted the volume on these old phonographs. This one's not in bad shape. There's a few scratches. The, um, the grill is missing for it, unfortunately. It'd be a lot more valuable if it had the grill, but the, the speaker grill is missing. In the top, though, here is the record player. You wind this thing up. There's no electronics in this at all. You crank this up, and then you start the record playing by flipping that lever and you would you would position the reproducer over the record and drop it now I'm not going to drop it because this is a uh, I don't want to ruin this record and this probably would ruin it I would think this is an Edison and it, I, I used a diamond pickup a diamond needle for vertically modulated records where the grooves go up and down and most 78s were made with a lateral groove. So there's a, there was an adapter that was made for this, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to seek one out. And if I can get one, I will, um, I will certainly um, do a video of it playing. I did shoot some stuff. I played for a few seconds. Well, hell, I'll just put it on. It will play from this record. This record will play. I think this might be a vertically modulated record. Um, could be wrong, but... But if I put this on just for a second, you'll hear some sound. Okay, that's about all I'm going to play. Because I don't want to damage the record. One of the things with with this type of, of uh, system was if I take out... I'm going to take out the, the, the pickup here. And we'll show you the pickup in close-up in a second here. So this is a geared system. So when you, when you move the pickup into position and drop it, it actually will move. This is gear driven. See, it's, not, oops, it's no longer free. I can move it one way, but not the other. Um, so, as the record plays, this is going to move. And the reason for that was with Edison's system, it was found that if the groove was set at a controlled rate from beginning to end, first of all, it increased the recording time. But second, it placed less wear on the record because the groove itself was not actually pulling the stylus along, as with the Victor system, the RCA Victor. The Victor talking machine is what it was originally called, the Victor phonograph. Uh, the lateral system, the groove actually, like a conventional LP, the groove is what pulls the stylus over. On this one here, it's gear driven. And they actually came out with a long playing version which you changed the gear. But I don't know if you guys can see that moving, but it is moving slowly. And this thing will, will wind down here in a minute because I didn't wind it up that well. So it'll probably start slowing down. But um, anyway, I see there's one on, on eBay uh, adapter. And what the adapter is, is it, it goes into the horn. Because this, this is just a hollow horn that feeds down, or a hollow tube that feeds down to that horn. Amplification is provided through the horn itself. Um, there is an adapter that goes on there that has a conventional, it has a pivot on it. So you, you put this in the middle basically and you don't engage it, you leave it up, right? It has a pivot that will pivot the, the needle back and forth and it uses a steel needle for those type of records, which most of them are. I'd, I'd love to get my hands on an actual Edison record. This one, I believe, is a, probably a hybrid. It's thicker than a regular 78, but it's not as thick as an Edison record. And that was quite critical. They had to be completely flat. Any warpage at all, of course, would influence the, the sound because the, the needle rides up and down as opposed to side to side. It rode up and down on the groove. So obviously using the wrong type of system on the wrong type of record it's going to destroy the record. That's why I'm not going to play this. I believe this record is a vertical because if you try to play a, 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 a lateral groove, you won't get much in the way of sound. But this one here does put out a loud sound. So I think this record, this is a very old record. This probably is a vertical, uh, probably is a vertical groove, although not an Edison. You can see how far this thing's moved over now, right? The time it's been playing. So 
once the record is over you just disengage and then you move it back and you stop it so that's the old Edison let's take a look at the uh, reproducer as it's called just for a comparison for size this is the size of the pickup or it's called the reproducer on this old Edison and you can see this thing's damn near as big as my camera this is the camera that I was shooting the first part of the video on the, the one that I'm shooting it on now is basically the same camera just the newer version this is the AX33 which I used for years and it's my secondary camera my backup and uh, I'm using the AX53 and that's probably why the sound is a little different because the microphone is a little different on the AX53 seems to have more stereo separation other differences between the cameras, this one's 20 megapixels and this one's 16, I think it's 16. For 4K you only need 9. So this one here has a 10 times lens and it will shoot a better still photo. So I typically take this one when I'm traveling because I can use it to shoot still photos as well and they rival my SLR which is, my DSLR is only, I think it's 20, I think it's 20 megapixels as well or 21. It's an older one, so I know they're much they're, they're higher than that now, but 20 megapixels is still very good. Um, anyway, I just want for comparison, size comparison, I just wanted you to show that this thing here is almost as big as, as my camera, lengthwise. I think it is. This is what drags around on the record. This has a permanent diamond stylus. There's what rides around on the groove. Get a, I guess that's about as close a shot I can, as I can get. But that's the diamond. And this thing is heavy. This thing actually gets forced down onto the record and it pushes up. So this actually, when this is lowered down, this actually pushes up and this drags around on the groove. And it pulls on the reproducer diaphragm inside. If I can get some light in there so you guys can see it. But inside there, there's a diaphragm. And there's a... Can we see it? There's a little wire that... There it is. You can see that little wire that comes from the needle itself. From the stylus needle. You can see when I... And if I just do that, you can hear the sound. The sound comes out of... And that's what makes up the old mechanical phonograph. It's just a diaphragm inside here that uh, you can see it. It's uh, there. It is. So that diaphragm vibrates. Don't worry about me damaging this thing. It's a diamond. It'll damage my finger long before it'll damage the uh, the pickup. And as it's dragged over the grooves which are vertically modulated, kind of like your fingerprint would be vertically modulated, it produces sound. Now the adapter for this photograph, many third party companies made adapters which fit the horn. So this part was the same size, but instead of having the reproducer vertically mounted like this, this part is horizontally mounted. So it, it actually has the reproducer mounted like that and it has a needle that sticks down and you it, it's got a swivel on it so it can swivel back and forth and it can swivel like this so the needle is pointing down and you put it on the record and you flip it down manually and you don't engage the horn you don't drop the whole transport you leave the transport disengaged because when it's engaged of course it's going to move because it's dragged across this one's moved at a fixed rate uh, for the for the uh, upgrade upgrade horn um, you drop the needle down and it uses a steel needle and then after you've played it once you take the needle out and you throw it away and you put a new one in and they used to be up until recently I don't even know if you can still find them I'm sure you can still find them I'm pretty positive you can still get them but up to about uh, I don't know 10 years ago when I used to visit Maine Electronics and uh, he would buy them by the bag and he oh yeah 100, 100 needles for 5 bucks they used to be 10 for a penny you paid a penny back in the 1920s, 1930s. You paid a penny and you got 10, and that would give you 10 plays. Because you know, some people would try to stretch it out and 
you know get a couple plays but the problem is the steel needle wore down very quickly and it uh, destroyed the records after it wore down um, many think the Edison system was a superior system with the vertically modulated uh, groove the, the problem is it required Edison's own records and what one of the things that killed this format which by the way I think uh, the last ones they sold was like 1929 somewhere in there um, these were sold in the in the 1900s the mid 1900s like the early teens and into the early 20s and then they, they, this one fell out of favor for the uh, lateral groove but um, many have said that the sound quality off the vertically modulated records was better than the lateral the diamond never wore out the, the problem was Edison himself, because they were only, he was the only one that produced the records for his photograph. It was his taste of music. And Edison being an old man at the time was more into the uh, the types of music that wasn't popular back in the 1920s and the 1930s, which was when the swing jazz was getting going. And that's what I want. I've, I've got all these 78 records that were handed down to me from my grandmother and they're all crap. They're all opera. I got a few Frank Sinatra records. And, uh, you know, uh, I'd love to be able to listen to some of the old ones um, on a real a real phonograph. And I'm, I'm trying to get the, the actual uh, pickup, the proper reproducer, to play back 78s. And once I get that, I will do an entire video dedicating it to this old wind-up wind -up phonograph. And we'll play some stuff. Unfortunately, I can't play the music, though, because even though most of the stuff's 100 years old, when I was doing my demo on the box of 78s that I was given a few months back, and I took that old that old Panasonic record player and I converted it up to play 78, and I tried to play some snippets of music that was over 100 years old, and I got hit by copyright. Almost immediately, I got hit with copyright and I had to remove it. So even though music is 100 years old, some of this copyright stuff still is being renewed. So no chance of playing anything like Bing Crosby or Frank Sinatra because uh, that will just immediately result in uh, an immediate copyright strike. Anyway, this has gone on long enough. Now you see what I was able to grab of an old estate that today, which is Thursday, December 2nd, anything that was left in that house is now in a dumpster. Let's see, we'll do another one on this once I'm able to either A, find an Edison record, or B, find the reproducer to play the conventional 78s. And I'm, I'm looking for both. I'm looking for an Edison record, and I'm also looking for the reproducer. But I'm not going to get it. There's one on eBay now, but I'm not going to get it in a bidding war. I've got my bid on it now, and if someone outbids me, they're going to get it. So if you see one on eBay, don't bid against it. It's sitting at like 20 bucks now. Don't bid against it because otherwise it'll go. <laughs> if it sits at 20 bucks, I'll get it. One thing I never thought about on this, this disc that I've got here is it's only recorded on one side. That's why I don't want to play it because I don't want to damage it. And it's, I mean, it's, it looks like it's got a fair bit of wear on it as it is, but this is a single-sided disc. On the back side of this disc is blank. And if I turn this thing on and drop the, the needle on it, I guess I have to give it a few more cranks here to get it going to speed. If I drop the needle down, you'll see it's actually going to scratch the surface. I'm going to wind it up a bit here. There we go. Get that sucker up to speed. Okay, see what it's doing here? So if you tried to play a conventional 78 with this type of uh, pickup, this type of diamond reproducer, it is going to really do a number 
on your records. I'm doing a number on this record because I'm playing the blank side so there's nothing on here. But you can see how it, the pickup is moving on its own. And that was Edison's way of doing things. Anyway, it uh, certainly is a conversation piece. This unit being well over 100 years old now. Anyway, thanks for watching.